Welcome viewers to Channel 17 Center for Media and Democracy here in Burlington, Vermont. I'm your host, Margaret Harrington, for the ongoing program Focus series. And we today we are continuing our human trafficking series. And the topic is using technology to support trafficking survivors. And viewers, let's welcome our guest, Dwayne Dunstan. Welcome, Dwayne. Oh, thank you. Thanks for having to, me here. <laughs> to Channel 17. And you're bringing your expertise as a Champlain College professor. And a uh, you have developed, a, you are developing a mobile app, YHAV, which is you have a voice to help bridge the communication barrier with identifying trafficking victims and survivors. Mm -hmm. So, Dwayne, we have delved somewhat into the subject of human trafficking here on this program, but now we are going into a, um, a deeper world of the internet with what you are doing. So can you tell us something about what the app is? Yes, the app is to help bridge the, the communication barrier is what it was, it, the original goal of it, its mission, if you will. And because <clears throat> with trafficking survivors having to talk about their ordeal to someone and look someone in the eye, maybe a stranger, maybe law enforcement, it, it, can, it, it may cause them not to want to communicate or to clam up or, or because of their, what they're suffering from, the um, psychological stress that, they're, that they've um, encountered and, and are under, it can um, cause them to not be able to tell their story. So this application is an electronic assessment. And you know some studies have shown that people are more likely to respond to sensitive questions via in a, uh, a computer. Um, assessment, and you know some theories around that is because they don't have to. A computer's not going to judge them first of all, and they don't have to look someone in the eye. They can do it at their own time and at their own pace. So, <clears throat> with this application, is hope that it can be that that bridge that allows them to, um, if they are currently in the situation, they can respond. That can get them help and get them out of the situation, or if they're a survivor. It can be used for a variety of purposes. One is if there are other people who are being trafficked by the uh, perpetrator, this may be that tool that could allow them to communicate and let others know that there are other people involved or what they went through so we can get them help. Well, because if someone is, has been trafficked, the you know psychological toll it takes, the physical toll is taken on, on them can be pretty tremendous and they need support, they need help. And this can be that tool that allows them to communicate with someone and say, hey, this happened to me, and giving it to, and professionals that actually administer it can then contact the right people, such as the Vermont Human Trafficking Task Force, to provide them the assistance that they need or give way to freedom that can help them as well. Yes, the Vermont Human Trafficking Task Force. Yes. So is this a government body? No, this is a consortium of people, and some do work for the government. Um, they're law enforcement, social workers, psychologists, and support providers that are available to assist um, and help with the investigation of a trafficking survivor, if, a, if an investigation even occur. Um, and, and that's based on each, each situation, each case is, is different. But they are a task force that's designed to assist survivors. Yes. Right. Dwayne, let's could you give us the scenario of how a, a human trafficking survivor would access the YHAV? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> That's the part that where I need the assistance from service providers and support providers. You know, um, it's kind of designed for like a law enforcement officer to guide them in an investigation. It's not an, a linear assessment. And let me take a step back to say that this is based on the tool um, developed by the Vera Institute. It's a trafficking victim identification tool. And so it's an empirically validated tool to help with the identification of a trafficking um, victim or identify a trafficking survivor as well. 
And what I did was just make it electronic and also to translate it into multiple languages because trafficking occurs. It, it, there's no country that, that's immune to trafficking. And someone may be in a country and they don't speak the language of the person who wants to try to get them help. Mm -hmm. So this tool can also try to be that, that, that aid or that guide to, to help, again, bridge that communication barrier. And the, uh, the, the people who would be administering this would be social workers, medical professionals. Medical professionals in particular, and there's some currently working with on um, a different version of this tool, which I can talk to you about as well, uh, because they're more likely to come in contact with a trafficking victim while they're still being victimized. Mm -hmm. um, 80 to 90 percent of trafficking survivors say that they, they, they went to a medical professional at some point one or more times. So they're in, in a very unique position to help with the identification. Same thing with police officers who are in a unique position, position to also come in contact with, with um, trafficking, trafficking victims as well. So um, it, it really is designed for a support provider or to be administered by, by someone. But you can also take some of the questions out and put them on a leaflet and you know, hang them up in places where trafficking is known to, uh, the sex trafficking in particular is known to be, uh, to occur, like hotels or um, airports and places of that nature. Mm. Yeah. So Dwayne, where are we in, um, where does the, uh, the app come in? To, like wh where do, when does the trafficking victim survivor mm -hmm, get mm -hmm access? Is it only through medical and legal help? Is that it? That's what it's originally designed for. It was yeah. designed to help first responders, people on the, on the front lines who are more likely to come in contact with a, a victim or survivor um, first, yeah. um, like a medical professional. And in a case of a medical exam, there are some known red flags that could trigger provide, given the assessment. So it wouldn't be given to every single person that comes into like the emergency room, for example, right, right. but only when they pre present with, with specific or cor correction with known red flags of trafficking, right. such as you know severe depression, um, dehydration. Uh, if they've visited multiple times with multiple um, sexually transmitted infections, or if they have multiple STIs that are present yeah. um, at that situation, would be red flags to that could trigger that. Right. and someone coming into the room who's talking for them, who won't leave their side. So it's, there are some well-known um, uh, indicators that could trigger given the assessment, but it also has to be given at the right time because if someone is present with them and they're, not, they're talking for the person, they won't leave the person's side, it may be difficult to get to, to administer the assessment, especially if the person catch on to what the questions are that are being asked as well. Right, It right. could put not just them in danger, but also the medical professional and those in the, in the medical um, setting in danger as well. How in danger, Twain? It depends on the situation. If they feel like if the medical professional, for example, um, improperly administers a tool and tries to force the person to leave or force the person to respond to the questions or they respond in a way that and they, and they make a statement that says, I, I, you know, I, I think something is going on here and that person's with them and they become defensive, they become aggressive, you know, it can become a hostile situation. Um, I don't have any specific case scenarios to, to, to speak of, but it, it can cause a, a pretty hostile um, environment and it may lead to the person not receiving medical treatment as well. Right. Yeah. And it brings to mind anyone going into the emergency room, we have to, uh, in, in distress as a, as a patient, we have to answer all those questions. And I'm, one leaps out at me, do you feel safe at home, is one question. Right. That, uh, so. and, and, and that's a question that I have experience with that, um, that you know, are, are discerning is that the question is, is not consistently asked. And it's sometimes asked in a way that puts the person who's being asked in an awkward position such as I, was, I went to a, a medical facility here and the question wasn't asked, do you feel safe at home? The question was it, was, it was told to me, I'm sure you feel safe at home. Oh, yeah, yeah. And, yeah. and so if I was in a position where I wasn't um, uh, feeling safe at home, that could have 
put me in a position like, oh, I guess I should be. <laughs> oh, I'm a male. I, I can't be abused. I can't be. I cannot feel safe. You know. Yeah. So that could have been a um, that could have been a missed opportunity for for someone. So people need training around how to ask that question, ask it consistently, and ask it in a way where they can get a response. It's not just a typical response of yes. <laughs> yes, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. And how are, so Dwayne, uh, when you, can you give us any of the, uh, an idea of what the app looks like? Mm -hmm. Like when, say, the, the survivor mm -hmm. sits down and in front of the computer. Mm -hmm. right? Yes. And what comes up? And, well, that, that's the part that comes into, that's why I'm still in the, in the development stage, <clears throat> because I'm, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a I teach cybersecurity, uh, and I'm also a programmer. <laughs> mm -hmm. I'm not in that world of of social support. Mm -hmm. So what I want to know and what I need to know is I need to work with <clears throat> an an organization that that it c can that comes in contact with that could come in contact with trafficking potential trafficking victims to find out how would you like to see this tool developed because I want it to be used. I don't want it to be a paperweight. I want it to be something that it can be used along with their existing intake um, procedures, or it can be used to um, not necessarily a replacement, but when they see those red flags. And my current, <coughs> I'm so sorry, my current recommendations for the development of it, are to have one question presented at a time. So one, you don't overwhelm the person. And also to have it presented in a way that there are no pop-ups, there's no room for error. They can stop the assessment anytime they want to. And also visually to be appealing so it doesn't, you know, it minimizes triggering events as well. So, you know, using things like color theory to determine uh, what colors are most calming to people? You know, in that case, certain shades of blue and white are found to be the, <clears throat> excuse me, to be the most calming. And to be short, because we don't want to overwhelm the person. And there was a study done back in, I believe, 2016. Uh, it was a project, it was a public health project with the UVM medical students and Give Way to Freedom. And they worked with that very early version of this tool, and they used it to um, administer it to, or, or um, study, I'm sorry, they used the tool to, um, with urgent care facilities here in Vermont, to determine if they would like to have a, an electronic screening tool to help with identifying trafficking victims. Mm -hmm. And the results of that would really let me know if we were onto something, if this was worth the effort, you know. And over 92% said they would like to have a tool like this, which was fantastic. <laughs> um, and the way it was presented or created was based on those theories, color theory, input theory, things of that nature. And so I had one question at a time, and they went through it. And they went to the short version of the assessment, which is 20 questions. And they asked, can this be reduced to three or four questions? because they have so many other, in this case medical professionals, have so many other assessments they have to do. And what I did was went back to the study, the original study, and found the top five indicators, or the top five, the top five um, questions that, would, that had the highest indicators that someone could be involved in trafficking. And when we reduce those down to five, you find that these are very common questions asked by many organizations. <laughs> especially in their intake processes. So organizations that are already asking those questions probably just need training in how to interpret it to determine whether or not this person could be involved in trafficking. So um, right now it's, it's in the holding development stage until uh, I can work with an organization to give me some feedback on how to make this usable and useful as well. Dwayne, when, when it was, when it was in, in, the, in that experimental stage, were there real uh, trafficking survivors who were taking the uh, those, no, those questions? No. No. Oh, oh, the original study. Yes. The original study. Um, yes. <laughs> the, yeah. um, the original study did were those questions were asked to those who were known survivors. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And also at the very beginning of your 
presentation here, uh, you you did verify that when we when we communicate with the uh, computer, we can be more honest than than challenged with somebody looking at us and uh, judging us, and we're looking at their body language and everything. But as, so, how could you could you tell us how uh, you would you would like this app? Uh, to be administered, like would the person be in in the bed in with the computer on his lap or the the laptop on his lap or her lap, and what what sort of uh, mm -hmm. environment would it be? The one challenge is ensuring the person who's using the tool they're they're technically literate first of all, no. and if not, then the other method in which this can be administered. Well, um, well, first of all, <laughs> I have one of my students, um, Jessica Turner, who's uh, currently editing the um, ASL version of this, um, which, you know, for someone who uh, you know, can't speak. And... Um, the a ASL? Yes, American Sign Language. Oh, okay. Yeah, so we have, yeah. That inter we have the, the assessment interpreted into American Sign Language as well. And oh. she's going through to cut up, cut the, edit the video <laughs> so you can present, you know, individual questions to someone as well. Yeah. Um, and in that case, you can have a TV <laughs> for um, for them, yeah. and then the um, service provider could play, you know, um, hit a, a button and it plays whichever question it is they want to ask. Because again, it's not a linear assessment; it's based on the you know the context and the situation. There's also audio as well, so if the person can't read, for example, or yeah. they don't they don't want it, this electronic device, they don't want to sit close to the person. Um, I could sit on the other side of the room and play it, and it reads the the questions in their in their native language. So that's another method in which it can be administered. And also hand them, hand them an iPad or you know a, a smartphone and they can respond to it and you know the results are then they, they hand the tablet back to the service provider and they'll see the results and can make that and it's used to help make an informed decision as well based on the context of the situation. Right. And uh, Dwayne, what about the survivors sitting there taking this, doing the app, uh, what, what do you hope to find out? I mean, are they, that they admit that they are being trafficked or that they need help or that they don't need help or? Mm -hmm. or uh, well, one thing is people don't, don't, may not even know what traffic is, be, what being trafficked is. Even though they are being trafficked. Even though they are being trafficked. Yeah. Um, because it, it can go back to person feeling like it's their fault that they got into that situation, and it's not their fault. Mm -hmm. um, so, and, and, and people may not, may not even know that trafficking, if you say trafficking, they may not even know what you're, what you're saying, what you're really saying. Mm -hmm. So the tool really is context specific, and that's why it's best to be administered by people who are trained in how to administer assessments and who are trained in how to identify trafficking. Because when they have those red flags that are present and they're not quite, they like, you know, I think something's going on here. And they can provide this assessment tool which can help, which can, based on the responses, can help with that informed decision. So it doesn't identify issues to help make an informed decision based on other circumstances, based on the, you know, each individual case. Yeah. So I see. So I see you, you're, you're making it clear to me that it is on the part of the administrators yes. that the information yes. is most important Correct. and not for, say, if I'm taking the app as, as a survivor, mm -hmm. that it's not for my enlightenment. Correct. Correct. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. We don't want to put that additional, well, you don't want to put that additional um, um, cognitive load on someone who's already under a, a heavy cognitive load <laughs> um, yeah. due to the, um, the stress and situation that they're, that they're already under. So it is for this, the um, administer, administrator and to help them with that informed decision to help, you know, make that link potentially between so, that's something there, but I'm not quite sure what it is. And, and that could be it. Yeah. And mm -hmm. what kind of informed decisions uh, would they be making? Whether or not this person is more than likely a trafficking victim or was, was involved in trafficking. For example, if someone goes into a, a, a homeless shelter and there's, there are some red flags that a person who's trained to identify trafficking um, uh, recognizes and 
this person is not responding to questions that, that's being asked, if you give them this tool, perhaps they respond to those questions, which can then help with that informed decision. Okay, I think this person was involved in trafficking. Now, the other part to this is not just administering this tool, <laughs> making an informed decision, but having a plan in place on how to respond as well. And that's why we have, we're lucky to have this task force here in Vermont who can respond to cases of, suspected cases of trafficking. Okay, so this is your, you're answering my third question here. How does the, uh, you have a voice app help trafficking victims and survivors? Yes. Mm -hmm. So that is, is a major way. That, that's the major thing. It's not just administering a tool. Okay, I think this person involved in trafficking, but having a response plan as well. And of course, Dwayne, this is in the developing uh, stage. And that's, well, let's go to the next question. What are major challenges you face in developing, and you are in the process of developing this, this yes, app, but, yes. you, but it's also being used at the same time as you're developing it. The, so what it's are not, major- It's not being used, we're, we're, ex, we're that's, that's one, that, that, I'm gonna to respond to your question with that, with, okay. that, with that comment actually. Okay. <laughs> um, one of the, again, one of the major holdups is working with an organization so we can get this tool in use. Now, I'm working with uh, Jordan Greenbaum, not Jordan Greenbaum, excuse me, um, who's a, a pediatrician and also an expert in identifying trafficking victims. And she developed a screening tool with six questions which can be used to help with ruling out whether or not a child is involved in sex trafficking or not. Mm -hmm. And I reached out to her and discussed translating that six question screening tool into multiple languages. And yeah, she responded right away, very excited about this, which was fantastic. And I'm also working with um, Dr. James Metz and um, um, Renata Liberty at UVM. And we're now collaborating, and one of my students, Jessica Turner, we're now collaborating together to develop this child sex trafficking screening tool into an electronic assessment to also be administered in um, emergency settings as well. And Dr. James Metz is the UVM child abuse physician. And, uh, you know, I don't like when he's busy, <laughs> you know, uh, you know, trying to reach out to him and, um, and set up meetings. I'm like, oh, he's busy. I don't like this, this situation. How do, you, how, how do you spell his last name? Dr. James? Metz, I believe it's M-E-T-Z. Okay, at yes. UVM, and where is Dr. Greenbaum? <clears throat> Dr. Greenbaum, <clears throat> excuse me, is down in Georgia. Okay. Mm -hmm. And Renetta Liberty, she's at, she's a forensic nurse at UVM as well. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, so, and, and, and that's, that's been one of the challenges. The other key one is funding. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, initially, I was funding this out of my own pocket with, with translating the assessment. And I had a student at the time, Janae Lamb, and she did a lot of work <laughs> with this mm -hmm. tool initially when it, where we had the foreign language. And then I was, I was trying to get a website developed to show people what this tool could do. So essentially, once you have a, it translated to one language, someone who speaks that language can interview someone in, that, in, a, in all the other languages we have available and vice versa. So every new language we have, it just opens up the door wider and wider and wider to who we're able to, um, to reach with this, with this kind of tool. Dwayne, just a moment yes. there, a yes. technical moment. When, a technical moment yes, to, yes. to explain yes. how, how that would work with the language so that. Oh, um, I wish we had, a, I should have bought a computer so I can, so I can demonstrate it. Wow. So, um, <clears throat> so you have the app and then the assessor would select the language that they speak and they can select the language of the person they're interviewing. Yeah. And then the questions would then be based on the assessor sees it in their language and the person the interviewer sees it in their language or hear it in their language as well. Mm -hmm. Well, in the case of ASL, they press a button and the um, screen will, it will sign to them what the question is that's being asked. And you're okay. talking about immediate communication. Immediate communication, yeah. yes. And, um, and so she did a lot of work with the editing of audio, <laughs> of um, the text, the foreign languages, and you know we, we lost funding for um, some work study positions, so it, it just stopped, <laughs> just like that. Yeah. Where was that and funding coming from? Funding was coming through work study when I was at Champlain College, the, okay. the very first year I started this. Mm. And now this project is um, 
supported by Champlain College as, as far as being within the um, donation pool and available funds for the um, mm -hmm. for its development and had a fundraiser last year, I believe, and was trying to raise $7,000 to help with the continued development. We didn't quite meet that goal, but we did pretty well with it. And now it, it's really dependent on, on work study funding to hire students to, to be able to continue to support and development of this tool. Mm -hmm. So, um, and I received a, a small grant this, sem this semester to help with that translation of the child sex trafficking tool. And so we're able to move forward with that and have money set aside to work with our um, Champlain's um, Emergency um, Media Center, which is gonna help with putting together a team of students over the summer who can help us develop this, the child sex trafficking tool. Mm -hmm. And really funding is, is a key part of it. And it's also one of my weaknesses. I don't know how to ask for money. <laughs> mm -hmm. And often to um, get grants, you need to hire a grant writer without money, it's hard to get a grant writer. So um, that and also then working with organizations to make this useful. Because I really, I can create um, a version of it and put it out there. But if I don't get feedback on whether or not it's useful, it just becomes another app, mm. <laughs> if you will. Um, so I, I want to work with service providers to find out how to get this out there and use and useful to people and, and, and make it um, accessible um, and and um, yeah, and easy to use. Yeah. And who? Uh, what are what service providers do you want to? Re you can reach out to them mm -hmm. on this program. Mm -hmm. So which which ones are you are you looking at? Uh, medical professionals, <laughs> um, law enforcement, <clears throat> uh, social workers, uh, service providers that work with um, uh, teenagers, works with the homeless, um, works with. Uh, People who've been uh, um, abused, that could that could have been some trafficking involved. Um, also, um, mental health counselors as well, who may come in contact with um, trafficking survivors. My wife is a mental health practitioner, and she's worked with a trafficking survivor before as well. So, you know, it, it trafficking comes in all forms, um, but it, it really needs to be administered by people who are trained to identify trafficking survivors and trafficking victims, or just have um, that, that general knowledge in, of, of trafficking and, and the people who are more likely to respond to a crisis situation. Um, and again, those, those people I just named are the key ones. Medical is number one, law enforcement is high on the list, social work, again, um, teen support, homeless, um, runaways, those are the support providers that this tool could be most useful for and the ones who it'd be great to work with to get some feedback to get it out there. <laughs> yeah, okay, well hopefully this program will help you, will helps, helps you get it out there. That'd be fantastic, Yeah, yes. and Dwayne, um, I was going to ask you, and I will, but when did you first found, find out about human trafficking? Because I think that your story is because you have taken on this work so fully and for a long period of time in your young life right. that, that it's taken up a lot of your life right. since you were, tell us about how you first uh, found out about human trafficking. Yes, back in 97, um, <clears throat> when I graduated from college, I went to Thailand to teach English. Mm -hmm. And the Bangkok Post had this uh, expose, it had an English version, and it had an expose on human trafficking, about, I think every two weeks. and. As I'm like, this is slavery. This is this actually exists. Yeah. This is the problem, and finding out that many of the methods that were used to enslave people, um, it, it's, it, these are well-known methods of. And in the case of um, Thailand, a lot of people from poor um, rural areas were um, led or you know, groomed and led into trafficking, or they were forced into trafficking, uh, and. And I, it just, it just, I kept reading these stories, and it, <clears throat> excuse me, also hearing about all these organizations that were available to help support the survivors, which was fantastic to get them back on their feet again, to get them back into society. Um, and I, I, I apologize, not back into society, but back into um, uh, their, their free will, <laughs> yeah. uh, the society as they want to live, <laughs> yes. by all means. Because in trafficking, they don't have that free will. 
And after I left, you know, it, it just, those stories stuck with me and the issue of trafficking stuck with me um, because it's slavery <laughs> um, is what it is. And I wasn't sure what I could do about it. I know I didn't have the, um, really the emotional stability to really work with someone <laughs> involved in trafficking because I don't know how I would have handled myself <laughs> mm -hmm. as far as I, I'd have been empathetic and sympathetic but you know it takes you know you really have to know how to ha you know work with people who um who are who, who are vulnerable in, in that situation and, and distance yourself <laughs> from you know the um the, becoming overwhelmed with your own emotions and things of that nature and I was living in Asheville North Carolina at the time and I went to a bookstore and <laughs> I saw this book called um, The Slave Next Door. And it was about trafficking here in the U.S. Because people tend to think, when they hear trafficking, they tend to think it happens over in Asia or in Eastern Europe. But it's, it's everywhere. <laughs> and it was, it was interesting. That night, I went home. And it was in October. <laughs> And I saw one of my friends post on Facebook that she was going to participate in the National Novel Writers Month, which is in November. And it's to get people to write a novel, uh, uh, was it like 50,000 words within a month? And it just, I, I, I can't tell you what the aha moment was or anything, but it kind of struck me. What if I wrote a novel about human trafficking and technology? And to me, it was a great idea, but I didn't know where to go with this. <laughs> and and I thought about the work that I, that I do, I did, cybersecurity, and I was working on a team that investigates when there are um, intrusions in, in, in computer systems. Like, what if I write about a hacker <laughs> and human trafficking? And it started to evolve, and I decided to create, write a novel on a hacker that stumbles upon a human trafficking operation. And basically what it, what it does to them, how it changes them. And, and that led to that, my very first novel, Twisted Greed, where the um, protagonist, Dewey, um, you know, is, is involved in a hacking group and stumbles upon a human trafficking operation and, you know, and, and, and what, it, what it did to him and, and, how, and how he helped with, or provided some assistance <laughs> with um, trying to determine who's behind it and things of that nature. Mm -hmm. And you, you wrote the novel. I wrote the novel, yes. How yes. wonderful. And yes. viewers, I'm reading that novel right now. I got a, my e-book e <laughs> copy of it, and uh, it's an amazing novel. I, I've just gotten to the part where the protagonist, Dewey, finds out about human trafficking. And viewers, this, this novel made me weep at the, uh, at the revelation to the, the young young man in the novel and his the society around him and his his uh, awareness his opening uh, the the window of awareness and uh, Dwayne Dunstan you've done a, a marvelous uh, job in that novel oh thank you so. I, I do want to mention that the uh, proceeds from that novel actually donate that to trafficking operations so um, all royalties go there so this is uh, so we've come full circle on our our small program here, but uh, you've you've presented such a uh, an optimistic route for uh, for professionals and for pe people in uh, who are concerned people like my viewers and and myself to to look upon what you are doing and say ah oh, there is some hope yes and you, with with your hard yes. work and your uh, you're sticking to it. I mean, it, it, with with your after your youthful uh, experience in Thailand, mm -hmm. and uh, mm -hmm. the fact that you are staying with it mm -hmm. is 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 so wonderful. Thank so, you. viewers, let's 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 listen and learn here, and we'll continue on. And maybe Dwayne Dunstan will return in time to this uh, to this program uh, with new developments yes, in this. Yes, indeed, I hope so. <laughs> and uh, it offer, the app, YHAV, You Have a Voice, offers access in 30 languages. 
and this is what is wonderful. So thank you very much, Dwayne. Yeah, thank you for having coming me. Here. Mm -hmm. And thanks, thanks you and uh, Absolutely. Thank you. return again. Thank you, viewers. Till next time.